Thank you very much. Um, I'm scheduled to give a, uh, a rap on what happened and or things that I uh, have seen here and to sort of make some recommendations. So let me very recklessly and boldly uh, do what, uh, what I um, have been asked to do. I think that in, it's important in approaching this matter, and Shireen said it so well, to be clear of what we're talking about. The definitional issues are clear. And I think there has been a fudging here of putting together the humanities and the social sciences under the same tent. It's different if you're teaching public administration, which is a skill demanded in the country in different forms of legislation, or if you're teaching classics. You're in a different space, conceptually, epistemologically, and in terms of the pressure from the bean counters. So I accept that. But this is something we have had to live with because of, um, of uh, the kind of decisions we made right at the beginning. So I think we need to be sensitive to this difference between, as it were, the fracking of the Karoo and the kind of nostalgia of the Karoo, if I can put it that way. Secondly, it seems to me incredibly important that we bear in mind, and it's run through this conversation, that efficiency, which is the hallmark of running institutions under neoliberalism and under the dominant discourses, efficiency discourses and the humanities do not belong in the same breath. I think the reading culture, the necessity to read, reflect, these kind of issues are so central to the humanities that if we go to what Shireen called the scientism of the humanities, we lose so much. And that's why books are important. And I think that we've got to stick, humanities people must stick to the idea that books are important. And that is where the real knowledge is produced and not simply in the accredited article. Thirdly, I think the chalk face conversation has been absent in these issues. And I was grateful, and this is the fourth point, for the issues raised by Shireen. Restructured degrees to four years, I'm going to come back to that. Fund postgraduates. Shamal Jeppi told me some years ago that the success of the Brazilian model, if you look at their publications, am I right? Gone up the day they started to fund uh, postgraduate students. Give them a salary they can live on. Give them a stipend. Recognize where in their lives they are. Give them opportunities to meet together. And your publication, uh, your, your publications will go up. Teaching assistance, absolutely critical. More faculty important and also field work, funding for field work. Now, all of this is a fiscus problem, and it's a fiscus problem inside the university and nationally. And my friends, if we don't talk about the importance of higher education continuously and engage it in the public domain, no one else is going to do this for us. We have to do this. We have to defend this turf. If you look at the business community, they're out there, they defend their turf all the time. This is a real challenge for us as intellectuals and as professionals. Fifthly, I think the question of the curricula is crucial. And I want to come back to that to minute, uh, in a minute, and it's linked to the four-year degree. <laughs> what I think, and this is the sixth point, what I think is extraordinarily important is to examine and understand the, epistemolo the epistemologies which we use, to negotiate, to understand that where we are located in the territoriality, in the territoriality I got it right, uh, where we are and who we are. I mean, one of my favorite African stories, if I can tell it, of being in South Africa, I phoned uh, Roger Southall when he was at the, NRA, uh, at the HSRC and I asked the lady there, can I talk to Professor Southall? And she said, sir, Professor Southall is in Africa. I said to her, aren't we all in Africa? So I think there's a challenge here, and it's a real challenge. It's a challenge which we have to take up and work with in fundamental ways. And part of that is Michael Neocosmos's point about 
alternative perspectives. Where is the Salberton studies? Where is the deep stuff that we all know exists about our own experience? Where is, the, uh, where is that? How can we appropriate and use that? The very last time I was on this platform, it was about innovation. Some of you were here, and a gentleman spoke about, he thought South Africa's settlement, political settlement, should be put on an, I, on an IT app and sold. So, I mean, this was a bizarre story. But there is something in it. There is something in there in what we have gone through as a people that is a deep form of knowledge which I think increasingly we turn our backs to. We turn our backs away from that, not understanding its theory, its history, its practicality, all of these kind of things. So I think we've got to engage with that. The seventh point is about uh, the divide between the humanities and the social sciences. As I said previously, this is not an either-or question. This is a way in which we understand the world and how we try to make sense of the world. And how we make sense of the world today in the humanities is also through computing. So we have to understand this world and we have to engage with this world. It has deep implications for pedagogy and for curricula. We know that the students are miles ahead of us on the cell phones. We know that a 10-year-old can tell us how to do this. Their forms of learning are different from ours. And so we have to adapt constantly to this kind of world. And this is a challenge for the humanities, as much as it is a challenge for mathematics or physics or other, or other fields. I think we have to see the continent as the archive and the project. And I think that's one of the deep themes that's emerged here, not only in these conversations we've had about being African, but I think Sharm el Jepi has challenged us to see the continent as the archive and the project. And it's going to mean a lot of retooling and a lot of rethinking and a lot of daring to think bold about the continent and about Africa. Also the global south. We've got to see the global south as critically part of who we are. In some ways, and it's completely a wrong way because this is mainly concerned with, with, uh, with the money world, is that the BRICS Association does open up space for us. It's an issue Sharmal and I have spoken about before. It does open space for us to get engaged with other countries of the South. But that raises the challenge of language. I have been thrilled, amazed, and a little bit flummoxed about the conversation around language. English is not the only language of knowledge. Let me say that again. English is not the only language of knowledge. And I know, I mean, the whole system, our whole academic system is built around English. Publish here, publish there, publish there, publish in English. I don't think that we should fall into that trap. Two years ago, I wrote a chapter for a book in Afrikaans. I wish I'd written it in Afrikaans. My Afrikaans is good, but not that good. It's a wonderful piece of writing. Unfortunately, Dion Geldenes did all the translation for me. But anyway, it stands. So I think that we've got to be careful about you know, recognizing that other language is knowledge. Other languages can exist in knowledge, and knowledge is made by other languages too. I may just in a footnote say, it seems to me one of the failures that we do is don't stand up sufficiently to people who... Uh, are in charge of us who insist that we publish more and more and more. If I can just make one other personal comment. This last uh, three months, I've been writing a chapter for a school textbook. What did you call these things under the ops or caps? caps. This thing has damn near killed me. <laughs> because it's on a subject I know a lot about, the end of the Cold War, I know all of this stuff, but to put it in a language that school children could understand has been an enormous challenge. And so I think we've got to think adventurously. We've got to think outside of the frames which we are presented. And I'm sorry the dean is gone, but I don't, you know, if, uh, if uh, the NQF is the law of the land, we should change it. Okay, so what are the challenges that we think uh, you can, and I hope, Madam Dean, you're going to write down these because I've got a list of ten for you that will grow out of this. Before I come to that, 
I think we must say that the school system is something we have to be concerned about. We will not get graduates through our system unless the schools improve. Twelve years ago, ten years ago, I was in administration at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, I was the vice rector for academic affairs, and I knew then that the school kids going in would be our students in ten years' time, twelve years' time. Every cohort of students that goes into the schools now, the younger people here will have as their students. That's why the school system matters. That's why what happens in schooling matters. So all of us, I think, throughout this country should take up this as a crusade. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that what happened in, uh, in Limpopo province is a travesty. We've got to do something about it. So, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, here are some things. I, I would suggest that you start a long-term conversation across the university on epistemology. And it has to be in the form of seminars on epistemology. And they have to be led by leading people and by people inside the university. You need a con we need a conversation on epistemology. That's crucial. Because the default position of this Western knowledge versus African knowledge is to go through the market, to see the market as the mediating force. And that happens too much in this country. We don't confront who we are, why we are, we mediate through the market. And all of that does is it strips us of all forms of empowerment. So, a conversation about epistemology. Secondly, I think what would be really exciting and path-breaking in this country would be to start a conversation about the liberal arts curricula and the four-year degree. This is a conversation that needs to come back. Again, let me say, I'm sorry the dean isn't here, but the four-year degree seems to me to be the only way through this. And it has to be liberal arts. It has to link your science to the philosophy. Every student has to do a course which is called uh, Mathematics for Poets. Sounds crazy. My son has the privilege of being a student in Utrecht at the, at the University College in Utrecht. He, he won a scholarship to go there. He has done a course on Mathematics for Poets. Fantastic. And I said to him, well, this must be a dumbed-down form of maths. He said, are you crazy? This is the most deep maths I've ever studied. So we've got to do these things. We've got to build on these things. So there's a challenge for you. Uh, a deep conversation about the, a liberal arts curricula and a four-year degree. And that has to put the student first. That has to put it from the chalk face. It's going to be difficult to do. It's not going to be easy to do. I mean, one of the things you could do at UNISA, and this was one of my other points, have you thought of this? An engineering student who goes to Stellenbosch gets, when he walks into the university, a new computer. He gets it. On that computer is all the work that he will need for his four-year degree. All the work. Can you do that at this university? Can you give each student that enrolls? I mean, the figures are astronomical. But the prices are coming down of computers. The prices of your publishing of, of books and pamphlets, I bet you, is going up, okay? Is there a moment where, the two, where these things can meet? Where every student who comes to this university has a computer and everything on the computer that the student needs. Now, there's a challenge. If you're a distance university, that's the challenge. Uh, but you can change. I mean, we've got to change the way we think about these things. Fourthly, because I've mentioned three already, uh, three already I think that we should accept the challenge of publishing with our students. We should accept that as a challenge. We should find ways without abandoning these really important points that Shireen raised about, uh, about nurturing individual critical facilities or faculties. We should, do, we should still encourage ways to publish with students because that is the pathway to beginning. But not only publishing in the so-called magic list you know, the so-called list that the dean gives every day. You have to publish here and here and here and here and here. Publish it where you think things can matter. Where you think things can matter. That's important. I mean, 
at the at the ASIF Council, there was a long period inside ASIF where you know the conversation was really about publishing in international journals. Suddenly, the scientists said to us, "No, no, no! Internationally, people are saying this knowledge should be published locally. So publish in local journals. I think we've got to nurture local journals. We've got to say these things are important to us because this is where our knowledge is and." It's important because it matters to us. It can change us. I was struck by um, Shamil's important point about doing an audit of skills, of skills and knowledge forms about Africa, about about uh, uh, the Lusitania, uh, the Lusophone world, about areas of the world where we know very little, but which we have a lot in common. Who knows in this country anything about the Philippines? Or about the problems that Filipinos have in schools? Or about the success of the Filipino education system? Or about the power of Filipino universities? This is a whole set, and I bet you you'll find someone in this university who knows something about that. So I think that's important. Six, language, language, language. We have to find a way to have this conversation. We have to find a way to insert language continuously, and we have to recognize you know, the point that language is the limits of what we know. If we want to understand the world, we cannot understand it in English. I've been there, I won't say anything more. Eighth, I think, and this builds on Sharmel's point, I think it's really important to engage the humanities outside of the universities. We need to go to festivals. We need to go to the Grahamstown Festival, or the Nelspreit Festival, or the Cherry Festival up, up in uh, Mahubisluf. And we need to talk to people about what, what the humanities are, why the humanities matter, how significant the humanities are. A few weeks ago, and uh, I'm sorry to talk in terms of myself, a few weeks ago I was in Muldura, which is a tiny little place up on the Murray-Darling Basin in Victoria, Australia. I went to a book and poetry fair. Four days of writers talking about their work, poets talking about their work, they were a pain in the neck, uh, and that's what we did for four days. That's where academics should be engaging publics. That's where the humanities is happening. And universities have to find ways to engage that. If we insist that the humanities only belong in the university, we're being extremely short-sighted. So that's a challenge for you. I think areas which we still have to negotiate with, and here are two. One is the digital humanities have hardly been explored in this country. This is an absolutely crucial thing. How we digitize, how we use this. Are we teaching students to, to use the digital humanities? What does this mean? This is a conversation which hasn't even started in this country. And Shamal's point about the web as a form of humanities knowledge that constantly, and here's a challenge for UNISA too, get stuff on the web. Get your good, best people to publish stuff on the web because that's where your leverage and your pressure comes. And finally, and this is in the form of a thank you, finally it seems to me the conversation around this continues. This is only the beginning. This is only the beginning of the conversation about how important the humanities are. It will always only be the beginning of the conversation. But we have to build this and we have to converse with each other. Because, you know, I think if we don't do that, and this is the obvious point, we end up as sort of pursuing the magic money, pursuing the bean counters, and becoming, to use the word properly, Philistines. Thanks.